Well, good morning. Um, thank you so much for joining us online again this morning. Uh, if this is your first Sunday uh, joining us online as Enfield Town Community Church, then let me introduce myself. Uh, my name's Nathan. I'm one of the pastors here at the church, and I'll be leading us this morning through this online time of worship. To get the most out of these videos, it would help you if you had a Bible to hand. Um, perhaps you'd like to have a pen and paper as well. Uh, you might like to take notes later through our Bible teaching. Um, boys and girls, if you receive the email or your parents receive the email, then there should be a sheet uh, attached to this to help you listen a bit later to Tim teaching us from Matthew's Gospel. Well, as we begin our time, I'd like to read this morning a verse from Psalm 94. In Psalm 94, verse 19, we read this. When anxiety was great within me, your consolation brought me joy. When anxiety was great within me, your consolation brought me joy. We find ourselves, don't we, in the middle of anxious times. But in an anxious time, the Bible tells us there is a source of of joy. That joy is the gospel. That joy is the comfort of Jesus. And so as we spend time together this morning, we're very deliberately going to lift our eyes to the Lord Jesus. We're going to spend time fixing our hearts and our minds on him and focusing on the joy that we find in him. And so as we do that this morning, let me lead us in a prayer. Let us pray together. Loving Father in heaven, these are times when anxiety is great within us. We are anxious for those we love. We are anxious for ourselves. We are anxious for our community. Please, Sovereign God, with your consolation today, bring us joy. With the consolation of the gospel of our Lord Jesus, of his salvation, of his ever-present help, be a joy and comfort and solace to us today. Thank you that we can take some time together this morning in prayer. Thank you that we can take time to hear from your word and to come before you with songs. By your Holy Spirit, cause the things that we do together today to stir our hearts and open our mouths and change our behaviours. And we ask these along with the forgiveness of our many sins. In Jesus' name, Amen. Well, this week, we're going to try and add something new into our online service, something we didn't do last week, which was we're going to add some songs in. Uh, Tim Barnes, who's a, a member of our church, has recorded a number of songs for us from his home, uh, and we're able to sing along with them. Now, that may feel a bit weird for some of you sitting at home, uh, but I want to suggest that, that do whatever helps you. If it helps to sing along, then please do. If it helps to simply sit and listen to the words and the tune, then, then simply do that. If you want to stand, you're very welcome. If you want to stay seated on your sofa, then that is also fine too. Uh, but we're going to sing our first song this morning. Bless the Lord, O my soul.
Boys and girls, uh, we're now going to have our, our kids slot again. Glenn is going to bring us something from his shed. And so now, over to Glenn. Good morning, boys and girls. I hope you are holding up well. As I mentioned last week, we're working through the sections of this book, Everything a Child Should Know About God. And last week, we looked at what is the Bible. We saw that all scripture is God-breathed. And this week, we're going to look at what God has made. And I want us to be people who point at things and other people and say, God made you. Wow. Isn't God amazing? Why don't you have a practice quickly with your mum or dad or your brother or sister? Point at them and say, God made you. Wow. Isn't God amazing? Now point to someone else. God made you. Wow. Isn't God amazing? And to help us with this this week, 
I have been making things. Look at this. This is what I made earlier. This is my bowl. Uh, I made it. It looks very fancy and I'm very proud of it. It took me a couple of minutes. And I believe that this should hold water. See, it holds, oh, it's leaky. Oh, oh, no, it's sort of, uh, oh, oh, that's made a bit of a mess. But anyway, I still think it's amazing. But then I found this. Have a look at this. It's the world's largest bowl found in Jingazen, a place in China known as the Porcelain City. See, this bowl is about 80 meters high and 40 meters in diameter. That's about eight times taller than your house. And this giant bowl makes my bowl look pathetic. The world's largest bowl is very impressive. Well, sort of, until you stand it next to one of God's made bowls. Why don't you ask your parents, what is the largest ocean in the world? Mum or dad, which one? Yeah, it's the sp the Pacific Ocean. The Pacific Ocean is the largest and deepest of the world's ocean basins. It's about 63 million square miles. That is so big that it's 670 times bigger than the United Kingdom. It's so much more bigger than this giant bowl from China. And God made it simply by speaking. That should make us point at it and say, God made you. Wow. Isn't God amazing? But that's not just it, because I've been making other things. I've actually been making some light. Now, I needed to borrow my son's torch from this, and it has this little squeezy thing at the bottom, which allows me to make light. Do you see that light? See, that's what I've been making this afternoon as well, when I really should have been studying for Corn Hill. But you see, this little light is a bit pathetic when you compare it to the world's brightest light, which is found in Vegas. Look at this. This light is at the top of a pyramid and can shine right into space. It's so bright that it can be seen over 100 miles into the sky. Isn't that amazing? 100 miles into the sky. And that, that makes my light seem quite pathetic. It's so bright. But actually, that light is quite pathetic when you compare it to some of the lights that God has made. You see, this light shines into the sky about 100 miles. But God has put a light about 93 million miles away from our Earth, which shines and lights up half of our Earth. It's called the sun. And that light is so strong and so amazing that it causes plants to grow and it feeds our earth and that's not even the brightest light that God has made God has even made a light called Icarus which can be seen from five billion light years away you see God is so powerful so amazing that we should look at the stars we should look not directly at the sun but we should look at the sun and say God made you wow isn't God amazing? And these are just two examples, and there are many others. There are humans, there are me and you and the complexities of us. There are birds that fly, fish that swim, the air, trees, and many other things which are all made by God, which should make us point at them and say, God made you. Wow! Isn't God amazing? So why don't you look out your window? Have a look at a few things that God has made. Birds, trees, anything like that, and point at them and say, God made you. Wow, isn't God amazing? Or maybe just before bed tonight, go to the window, have a look out, look up in the sky and have a look at the stars and point at them and say, God made you. Wow, isn't God amazing? Or maybe just remind your parents, your brothers and sisters that God made them and point at them and say, God made you. Wow, isn't God amazing? Let's be people who remind each other of how amazing our God is because of the things he has made. I'm going to add a song on to the end of this. It would be about a minute long. After that, it's going to cut back, cut back to Nathan. Cheers. There's an ant plant, hand span, ham spam, jam tram, man, man, boy, girl, cheese flan. There's a car, spa, tar bar, aardvark, hardbark, shark, dog, park, walk, lark. 
God made everything you see. He made you and he made me. There's an inkling, pink drink, zinc, blink, sinkling. God made everything. There's a prawn, lawn, dawn, horn, pick, tick, pick, dig, zoo, zoo, lulu, two, two. There's a hot spot, not pot, top, cot, dot, yacht, bees, knees, flea, ski, sneeze. God made everything you see. He made you and he made me. There's a crane, brain, mainframe, plane, grain, plane, rain. God made everything. Oh, God made everything you see. He made you and he made me. When you look everywhere, everywhere, stare. God made everything. There's an ant plant, hand span, ham span, jam tram, man man, boy girl, cheese flan. There's a car spa, tar bar, aardvark, hardbark, shark dog, park, quark, lark. God made everything you see. He made you and he made me. There's an inkling, pink drink, zing blink, sink ring. God made everything. There's a. Brawn on dawn horn, pick tick pick nick, zoo zoo loo loo two two. There's a hot spot, not pot, top cot dot yacht, bees knees, fleece knees sneeze. God made everything you see. He made you and he made me. There's a crane brain, mainframe, plane brain, plane rain. God made everything. Oh, God made everything you see. He made you and he made me. When you look everywhere, everywhere, say God made everything. God made everything. God made everything. Thanks so much, Glenn. Uh, well, we're going to have a slight tweak, boys and girls, this week. So there's no follow-up sheet today from uh, the kids' talk. Um, but as I said earlier, you uh, parents, um, you should have got an email that will help you to have a sheet for the children to listen as we go through our sermon a bit later. Uh, there's also some online materials, which I hope Glenn has sent to some of the parents to help you run a treasure hunter's type lesson uh, at other points, perhaps in the week or even this afternoon. Uh, last week, we spoke about something that Paul says to Timothy. He says, devote yourself to the public reading of scriptures. And again, for these times that we're meeting online, we've just picked a couple of Bible readings to help us hear from God's word. We'll simply read them uh, without comment and allow God's word to speak for itself. We're going to have two readings this morning. And our first reading is from Psalm 98. Psalm 98. I'll give you a moment if you want to find that. But in Psalm 98, we read these words. Psalm 98, a psalm. Sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvellous things. His right hand and his holy arm have worked salvation for him. The Lord has made his salvation known and revealed his righteousness to the nations. He has remembered his love and his faithfulness to Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Burst into jubilant song with music. Make music to the Lord with the harp, with the harp and the sound of singing, with trumpets and the blast of the ram's horn. Shout for joy before the Lord the King. Let the sea resound and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. Let the rivers clap their hands. Let the mountains sing together for joy. Let them sing before the Lord, for he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples with equity. Our second reading this morning is from Ephesians chapter 1. And we're going to read the first 14 verses. Ephesians chapter 1 and the first 14 verses. Paul an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to God's holy people in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. 
in love. He predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and understanding, he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. In him, we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we who were the first to put our hope in Christ might be for the praise of his glory. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. This is the word of God. Well, we're going to sing again. Uh, once again, feel free to sing along or to simply listen to the words. But we're going to sing before the throne of God above. Christ 
Christ on high, with Christ my Savior and my God, with Christ my Savior and my God. Well, we're now going to spend some time in prayer together. Uh, we're going to come before our God, before his throne of grace. Uh, just before we pray, let me share a couple of bits of family news. Um, before the, the further restrictions were put in place by the government on Monday, uh, I'm pleased to say that last weekend we were able to marry Tom and Ruth and Josh and Carol and Harriet and Ben, who will uh, commence formally their married life uh, next Saturday. Uh, I'm also sad to say that um, Joe Potter's dad died this week, and so we're going to remember the Potters in prayer. But let's begin our time of praying together by saying together the Lord's Prayer. Um, the words should appear on your screen. But let's say together, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. In Psalm 46, we read, God is our refuge and our strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Our God and our Father in heaven, we call upon you today to be our refuge. Father, we ask that you would be a refuge at this time for our country and for our world. Would we run to you for protection from the troubles that are besetting us? We pray, please, that you would be strength to our leadership. Father, please, would you help our leaders in this country as they make decisions at this time about how best to um, slow down the spread of this virus, how best to apportion the resources of our country, Father, please, in these days, would they run to you, not from you, for strength and for refuge and for help. We particularly commit our Prime Minister to you, who has contracted the virus. Father, please, would you bring healing to him, that he might continue to lead. Father, we also want to pray that you would be a refuge and strength and a help to all our health workers in this country. Father, we ask, please, that you would give them energy, that you would restore many of them to health quickly, that they might return to the front line of work. Father, please, would you raise up the resources and the testing kits that are needed to help our country at this time. Father, we also want to commit to you those who are sick. Please be their refuge and their strength and their ever-present help. Father, those who are at home and unwell, those who are in hospitals, Lord, please heal them. Please be merciful to them. Father, we pray for the many who are grieving in our country. Lord, please have mercy. Father, do not treat us as our sins deserve us to be treated. And Father, what we ask for our country, we want to pray for the world as well. Lord, please be a refuge and a strength and an ever-present help for, for countries especially that do not have the resources and the wealth and the technology that we do. Father, in these times of trouble, Father, may your church be refined and helped. And Father, please would we 
uh, be what you intend us to be in this world, that people might find you in these times of trouble. Father, I'm so grateful for the words of Jesus who said, I am the good shepherd. We thank you that Jesus cares for and loves his sheep. Thank you that he is the shepherd who has laid down his life for us. And so, Father, we ask, please, for Jesus' shepherding care of particular individuals in this church. Father, please bring your comforts to Joe and to Sarah. Would they know the shepherding help of the Lord Jesus, refreshing them, protecting them in these days? Please shepherd Tom and Ruth. Josh and Carol and Harriet and Ben as they begin their their married lives together. May they look to Jesus, the good shepherd, for all that they need. May they lack nothing as they are led by him. Please watch over and protect Chris Martin as she undergoes various treatments this coming week. Please help Jenny and Steve as Jenny has a scan tomorrow. And Father, please, in a more general way, would you help those in our church family who are sick? Would you heal them? Please, would you provide for those who find themselves in times of difficulty? And please, would you bring peace to those who are troubled, for those for whom these are difficult times, for those particularly struggling with the isolation? Father, thank you for the encouragements that many of us have already experienced of belonging to this church family. Thank you for the care that you have given through one another to each other. Father, please, in your mercy, would you act for your glory in these days. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're now going to have our main Bible reading. Um, And this morning we're going to return to Matthew's Gospel and we're going to continue the series that we've been doing in Matthew's Matthew's Gospel chapters 8 through to 10. And so grab yourself a Bible um, and this morning's reading is from Matthew chapter 9 verses 18 to 26. Matthew 9 verses 18 to 26. And Tim, uh, who's going to be preaching this morning, will bring us that reading now. Well, let's pick up again in Matthew chapter 9, verse 18. While Jesus was saying this, a synagogue leader came and knelt before him and said, My daughter has just died, but come and put your hand on her and she will live. Jesus got up and went with him, and so did his disciples. Just then, a woman who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak. She said to herself, if I only touch his cloak, I will be healed. Jesus turned and saw her. Take heart, daughter, he said. Your faith has healed you. And the woman was healed at that moment. When Jesus entered the synagogue leader's house and saw the noisy crowd and the people playing pipes, he said, Go away. The girl is not dead, but asleep. But they laughed at him. After the crowd had been put outside, he went in and took the girl by the hand, and she got up. News of this spread through all that region. This is God's word to us this morning. Let me pray, and then we'll consider these words together. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your word. Thank you for technology. That means we can listen to it together. And Father, we do pray and ask this morning you would teach us from it. That, Father, you would remove any distractions from our minds, from our rooms, that we'd be able to engage with your word, that we would hear your voice speaking to us, that you would increase our faith in our Lord Jesus and grow us to be more like him. 
Father, we pray these things now in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as the government announced this week that all non-key workers needed to stay at home and be self-isolated, it was welcome news to many, perhaps you too, that Disney have just released their own TV channel so you can watch film after film while staying at home. Well, it sounds good, even if um, you're working at home um, or you've got some epic homeschooling timetable. Maybe you'll find some time to watch some films. And when you do, and if you do, you'll find that all films seem to have this same pattern. You might have noticed it before. But in nearly every film, including Disney, there's always this moment where the main character is in trouble. Things look bleak. Hope of resolution seems to be fading. So, for example, Cinderella is left in tatters and all alone while the rest of the household go off to the ball. Scar kills Mufasa and Simba is chased by hyenas. Thanos clicks his fingers and half the world immediately vanishes. Forgive me if you didn't get any of those film references, but all films are alike. There are always moments of desperation and impossible situations. As you tune in this morning, perhaps you feel like you're in a Disney film. You're in some strange dream. You're still adjusting to doing life from home. Work, leisure, church from a sofa. We find ourselves in desperate times, don't we? We are at this point of not knowing what tomorrow or this week's going to bring. If you weren't concerned about the coronavirus a week or so ago, it's definitely on your radar now because it's halted all life as we know it. It's this unwelcome intrusion that's forced us to react and to adapt. It's a scary time. Now with films, for the most part, you can predict the outcome. The good guy's going to win. Cinderella will meet Prince Charming. Um, Simba will defeat Scar. The Avengers will triumph over Thanos. But what about now, today, for us? This is no fairy tale that we're living in. What confidence do we have of what's to come next? As the death toll in the UK and around the world increases each day, what comfort and assurances does the good news of Jesus bring? Well, as we turn back to Matthew 9 now, we're confronted with two impossible situations, and we're given two patterns of faith to follow. And this morning, we're going to see that impossible situations call for radical faith in Jesus' awesome power. Impossible situations call for radical faith in Jesus' awesome power. If you're a follower of Jesus this morning, I want these stories to help you to remember afresh who Jesus is. I want us all to see that he has power over impossible situations. That this morning we can take heart. That we may be encouraged to keep following him and to grow in our faith of him. To ask big things of Jesus and grow in our expectation that he can deliver If you're listening to this and you're not yet a Christian, well, my prayer is that today you would come to Jesus in faith and hear him say to you, son, daughter, take heart. Your faith has healed you. I pray you would come to see who Jesus is and that you would turn to him and trust him. Impossible situations call for radical faith in Jesus' awesome power. So let's start by looking at the impossible situations that this story presents. So in the, in the account we read, we find two very real and somber situations. These are no fairy tales. And the first one we see, this first impossible situation is of physical death. Look down at verse 18 in your Bible. While Jesus was saying this, a synagogue leader came and knelt before him and said, My daughter has just died. 
Jesus is still at Matthew's house, speaking about himself as the one who brings in the new. And as he's speaking, a synagogue ruler, a respected leader in his community, comes and falls at his feet. It's a sign of great humility. It's a sign of great desperation. Just just hear the anguish in this man's words. My daughter, he says, has just died. Isn't that horrific? No parent should have to bury their own child. It's a reminder that death shows no partiality to anyone. One in one die, young and old, rich and poor. It claims victims from all backgrounds and all nationalities. All of us have been affected at some point in our lives and all will inevitably face death. He says, my daughter has just died. This is an impossible situation. There's nothing that this man can do. There's no amount of money he can spend, no rituals he can perform to get his daughter back. Physical death. That's impossible situation number one. The second impossible situation we see in these verses is verse 20, and it's spiritual death. You see, in this verse, the camera moves away from the first desperate situation and it pans round and zooms in on a woman in the crowd. She has a long-term illness, 12 years of bleeding. Just look at verse 20. So just then, a woman who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years came up behind Jesus and touched the edge of his cloak. See, she's had this for 12 years. Isn't it awful? But it's even worse than you can imagine. Because in her condition, she would have been considered unclean by the law. And so she was unable to um, see family or to be close to her friends. See, some of you sitting at home today will be worried about how long this self-isolation will go on for. Well, this lady's been doing it for 12 years. In fact, just being in the crowd with the intent of touching Jesus would have been resented by all of them if they'd known. And yet again, crucially, her uncleanness would also have meant that she was not allowed to go to the temple. Her bleeding meant she was spiritually cut off from God. Though we're not allowed to meet at the church building, we can still meet with one another over the internet. We still have confidence and freedom to approach God's throne in the name of Jesus. But this woman had none. She was isolated. She was spiritually dead. Unable to change her condition. Unable to stop her bleeding. She was in an impossible situation. So there's two impossible situations. Number one, physical death. My daughter has just died. Number two, spiritual death. Twelve years of bleeding. A state of uncleanness. And friends, these are still impossible situations for us. The coronavirus has only highlighted what's always been true. Death comes to us all, and naturally we are spiritually dead. You see, in this season of this virus, there's been many good things that have come out of it. We've seen people sharing and caring for one another, much of which has been experienced in this church family. But there's also been a lot of bad that's been highlighted, isn't there? the greed and selfishness of people, of our own hearts? Well, when confronted with such impossible situations in this story, when there's nothing that could be done to fix it, well, what's the remedy? Well, we're given the answer in this account through two radical acts of faith. Impossible situations call for radical faith in Jesus' awesome power. Now, faith is all about looking to the right person. In our current climate, if you're ill, then you should look to a doctor, even if it's online or by phoning 111. If when isolation ends, you decide to head to the beach, isn't that a glorious thought? You head to the beach, you find yourself in trouble in the water, that's not such a good thing, then you should look to a lifeguard. And you look to these people, the doctor, the lifeguard, because they're skilled and because they're able to help you in the situation that you find yourself in. Faith is about knowing where to find help or who to look to. 
And then it's about going to them, trusting that they can deliver the help that you need. In Matthew chapter 9, when the ruler and the woman are confronted with impossible situations, they model radical faith. You see, look again at verse 18. The ruler says, My daughter has just died, but come and put your hand on her and she will live. Do you see it? The synagogue ruler has faith that if Jesus is involved, his daughter will be resurrected. She'll be given life back. That is radical faith, isn't it? That's a huge ask of our Lord Jesus. Now listen again to what the woman says to herself in verse 21. She says, If I only touch his cloak, I will be healed. No one's been able to help this woman for 12 years, since 2008. But she has faith that by touching Jesus' cloak, she will finally be healed and made clean. That is radical faith. She has huge expectations of Jesus, that if she just brushes him, she will be healed. And it's this kind of faith that Matthew is drawing our attention to in this story. In the face of impossible situations, he wants to lead us to the feet of Jesus. He wants our view of Jesus to grow and grow so that we would, we would see him as the ruler does and as this woman does. This radical faith is at the heart of these two kind of interwoven stories. See, so look at verse 22, what Jesus says to the woman. He says, Take heart, daughter. Your faith has healed you. See, this is the hinge to the two parts. Jesus didn't need to stop and turn to see this woman or to comment on her actions. He could have just left her. He could have let her go off and disappear into the crowd. But Jesus stops and speaks so that this woman and all of us listening on can be sure that she's done the right thing. See, look at verse 22. Take heart, daughter, he said. Your faith has healed you. And the woman was healed at that very moment. Jesus confirms that she was right to have such faith in him, that she was right to come and touch him for healing. Now, when confronted by any and every situation, coronavirus or normal everyday life, we should be those who look to the Lord Jesus in faith. Yet we're so often preoccupied or too busy to bring things to Jesus. Is it any wonder then that he allows suffering and pain and viruses to ravage our world? In a sense to wake us up that we would abandon ourselves and look to him. You see, this ruler has no one else to turn to, does he? But he recognizes something of Jesus' extraordinary power. Jesus, we cannot do this. Jesus, I cannot bring life to my daughter, but you can. Jesus, my daughter is dead, but you can bring her back to life. Jesus, if you come and put your hand on her, she will live. It's about you, Jesus. Jesus, I've been bleeding for 12 years, but you can make me well. If I only touch his cloak, I will be healed. It's about you, Jesus. This isn't magic, Both the ruler and the woman have an expectation of Jesus' power to do something awesome, to intervene and change their impossible situation. Do you share their expectation of what Jesus can do, of his power? Do you believe that Jesus has this kind of radical power? Impossible situations call for radical faith in Jesus' awesome power. Let's now turn just to the end of the story. We'll pick it up from verse 23. So when Jesus gets to the synagogue ruler's house in verse 23, we're told that on arrival there's this noisy crowd there. The pipes are out. The music's blaring. You see, in this culture, when someone died, even if you're a really poor family, you would pay for some professional mourners to come, people to come and play music and to cry. Now we're told these details because this isn't a game. This little girl really is dead. The funeral, as it were, has started. 
And so this makes Jesus' words in verse 24 both striking and a bit outrageous, doesn't it? Look what he says in verse 24. He said, go away. See, just picture it. This is more than awkward. This is a bit embarrassing. We're told that the people laughed at Jesus. You see, there's no mistaking the fact that this girl is really dead. This is not some elaborate ruse. These people aren't stupid. But Jesus says the little girl is not dead, but asleep. And the reason Jesus can say this is because he is so powerful. For him to raise the dead is like me waking up my daughter, Eleanor, after a nap. Just a tap on the shoulder will do it. Jesus takes the girl by the hand and she got up. She's alive again. The girl really was dead and now she really is alive. You see, Jesus wasn't being rude to the crowd of people when he told them to go away. He was just being honest. There was no need for them. The girl that was dead is now alive. We don't need mourners here. We need a party. You see, just like the unclean woman, the synagogue ruler was proved right to have such faith in the Lord Jesus. Impossible situations call for radical faith in Jesus' awesome power. Now, it's worth saying that this passage isn't a promise that Jesus will always make me well or prevent loved ones from dying. We know that's not true. And nowhere in the Bible are there promises for that in this life. But this story teaches us that it is right for us to ask Jesus to do huge things because he has awesome power and he is compassionate. This story is not a promise, but it's a pattern for all who look to the Lord Jesus in faith. You see, at this difficult time for our country, for our community, for yourselves, it's not wrong to pray to the Lord Jesus that he would stop the coronavirus or that he would restore loved ones back to health again. We should be praying these things. Jesus has awesome power and he alone can do the impossible. And yet here lies one of the big challenges, I think, of this passage. Many of us have too small a view of what Jesus can and will do. We say, well, I know Jesus can do this but he probably won't. We'll pray for healing, but he probably won't deliver. Friends, that's not radical faith. That's not the kind of faith that Matthew's presenting to us here in this chapter. That's just British scepticism. Impossible situations call for radical faith in Jesus' awesome power. And as we've seen here, Death in our world is an impossible situation. We cannot do anything to avoid it, and we cannot do anything to limit its power. But Jesus has done something. This story shows us that Jesus has power over death. He is willing and able to reverse death, to make the unclean clean, to raise the dead. And Jesus is able to do this because he has defeated death. Jesus went to the cross to die in the place of those who are naturally unclean and spiritually dead. Jesus at the cross wore our uncleanness. He experienced hell, which is isolation from God. And he did it so that we would recognize our impossible situation. That we might come to him in faith and hear him say, Son, daughter, your faith has healed you. Son, daughter, your faith has saved you. Do you have that confidence in the face of death? In the current troubles in our world, do you have this confidence that Jesus has awesome power? As our new screens daily announce this growing death rate of the coronavirus, both in our country and in our world, we can see that it is an impossible situation. What hope is there? Well, this story calls us to have radical faith in Jesus' awesome power. Jesus can cancel the coronavirus. He really can. He can bring all pain and all suffering to an end right now. And that might get you thinking at home, well, if that's true, then why doesn't he do that? Well, I believe he's waiting 
Jesus is patient with us. He's waiting for more people to stop ignoring him and to turn to him. He's patiently waiting for our world to face up to the impossible situations that we're in and then to run to him for help, to fall at his feet and to submit to his power. Jesus has immense power. He can raise the dead. He can make the unclean clean before God. Impossible situations call for radical faith in Jesus' awesome power. Will you turn to Jesus today in faith and trust his power? If you're a follower of the Lord Jesus, will you keep looking to him? Will you keep falling at his feet, asking big and expecting big from our powerful Lord Jesus? Impossible situations call for radical faith in Jesus' awesome power. I hope that God's word today brings you much clarity and assurance in these uncertain days. Um, Let me lead us in a prayer as we end our time together. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that Jesus has awesome power, that he really has conquered death that he reigns on high and intercedes for his people. Please help us to keep looking to him, to pray big prayers, to expect he will act for his purposes and for his glory in our world. Father, please hear our prayers this morning. We again commit the coronavirus and pray that in your mercy you would slow its progress and bring it to an end soon. Please keep us prayerful at this time, prayerful for our government, prayerful for our NHS, prayerful for one another. Lord, we especially pray that we would continue to grow in our faith in the Lord Jesus at this time. And Father, we pray all of these things now in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're going to respond and to what we've heard by singing a song in Christ alone. Let's sit or stand together and sing.
Up from the grave he rose again And as he stands in victory Since curse has lost its grip on me For I am his and he is mine Bought with the precious blood in life, no fear in death, this is the power of Christ in me, from life's first cry till final breath, Jesus commands my destiny, no power of hell, no scheme of man, can Thanks so much, Tim, uh, for sharing that with us this morning. Uh, we're going to bow our heads and let's have a final prayer together. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God our Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Well, thank you so much for joining us again this week. Um, we hope that you've uh, enjoyed worshipping with us online. Uh, just a, a couple of things to say. First of all, what can you do now? Uh, well, as I suggested last week, it would be great if you maybe picked up the phone and uh, talked to someone else in the church family, someone who might be on their own especially, uh, and why not share something from this morning, uh, say a prayer with someone. Um, that would be an excellent thing to do following uh, this video. Uh, the other thing to say as well is that our meetings will continue to be suspended until we, we give them further notice. Uh, we hope that you'll be able to set aside some time on Tuesday evening as well uh, to join us for our midweek Bible study and prayer. Um, you'll receive an email on Tuesday morning, which will give you a link to the audio that you can listen to. On Tuesday evenings, we're still working our way through Mark's Gospel, uh, looking particularly at, at 20 stories that get us to the heart of of why Jesus is good news. We'll also spend some time on Tuesday evening praying together. So on that email, look out for our church prayer sheet, which we call the grapevine, but that'll be great to do. Um, if you would like the church to be praying for anything in these times, please do let us know via the church office. Um, or if there's anything particular that you need for help, then do let us know and we'd love to help you. Thanks again for joining us this morning.